You're listening to the 2017 Nelson Arts Festival Page and Blackmore Readers and Writers Programme. This session features Alan Carter in conversation with Karen Stade. Welcome everyone. Oh, uh, my name is Naomi Arnold. I'm the Page and Blackmore Readers and Writers Coordinator. Welcome you, welcoming you to our very last session of the of the program. It's been a wonderful. Um, a couple of weeks, and I just want to quickly introduce Karen Stade, uh, who'll be interviewing Alan Carter, who's written this incredibly gripping um, novel set in our region, uh, which has been a real treat to read, just picking out all the familiar places. I um, just want to say a big thank you to Paige and Blackmore, who have been our sponsors for the whole festival. Um, please support them where you can, and I'm delighted to leave it to Karen and Alan. Thank you. Okay, well, good evening. Good evening. Wishing the day away. Good afternoon. Welcome. Um, as with all the readers and writers sessions, um, this uh, session's being recorded, uh, including the question time at the end, so just a warning there. Uh, it will be available as a podcast on iTunes um, in a couple of weeks' time, so you'll be able to download those and listen to this session and any of the other sessions from um, this year's readers and writers. Uh, just look for the um, Page and Blackmore Nelson Readers and Writers on iTunes. You're all welcome also to share this session on social media. Just use the hashtag Nelson Arts Fest. But please, everyone, can I ask you now also to turn your phones off or down? Thank you. So a, a, a brief introduction to Alan. He was born in Sunderland in the north of England and immigrated to Western Australia in 1991. After being shortlisted for the UK Crime Writers Association Debut Dagger Award... In 2010, Alan went on to win the Ned Kelly uh, Award for Best First Fiction in 2011. This was for Prime Cut, the first of his series featuring Detective Kato Kwong. It was Alan's move a couple of years ago, though, to a hobby farm in the Wok Marina Valley in Canvastown that led to the publication a few months ago of Marlborough Man, which features Detective Nick Chester. We'll be talking about Marlborough Man, this is it here. Um, but we'll also reference uh, the Kwong novels as well. <coughs> so, Alan, we'll start off. Um, I'm interested in knowing what prompted you to write crime fiction and what you want it to uh, reveal or reflect to us um, of the world and the people around us. You know, what questions do your books pose, moral or otherwise? Um, well, I think I was never really... Some people are born writers. I, I wasn't a born writer, uh, although I have been a, a storyteller for two or three decades as a documentary uh, TV filmmaker. Um, but the idea of writing a book was uh, as distant to me, like a little thing in the back of my head, maybe I'll write a book or maybe I'll swim the English Channel or maybe I'll score the winning goal in the World Cup. Um, all of them equally distant, but... Um, Finally got a chance to do that when my wife, Kath, who's just down here, uh, got a job at a place called Hopeton on the south coast of WA, which was opening up as a, a nickel mining town, part of the WA mining boom. And we all moved down there to uh, take up residency. And um, I was still doing my documentary TV work at the time. I was fly in, fly out the wrong direction. Um, so she basically gave me the opportunity to stay at home for a year, be a kept man, uh, and um, do the chores and child minding while she did the job. Uh, and in return, in my spare time, I could write this book that maybe was in me. So I found that it took about 10, 15 minutes every day to do the chores, and I could get on with writing. Um, so I chose to write crime fiction because crime fiction is what I read. I really enjoy... Um, I've been reading crime fiction since um, Enid Blyton's Famous Five, I suppose. Um, graduated through Alison McLean and Desmond Bagley and John Le Carre and a whole bunch of people. Um, but in the last couple of decades, it's been more the likes of Ian Rankin and James Lee Burke, people like that. Um, but the kind of crime fiction I like is the crime fiction that is telling me something about that society um, at that time. I think Ian Rankin himself is, as you said, if you want to know anything about a country, read that country's crime fiction. So if I was going to write anything, it would be crime fiction. Um, and so the, in deciding to do that, I was in a mining town, um, and I was interested in the underbelly of the mining boom. 
So I set about looking at what was going on. Uh, my research included looking at lots of um, types of exploitation in the mining boom uh, and, and what was happening there. Luckily, there was none happening in Hopeton because it's a pretty small town and you all knew where I lived. Um, but once I'd worked on that, then I came up with my characters and developed this story, which went on to do really well. I didn't actually even think I would get published at that point when I just set out writing the book. That was also a distant dream. I knew the statistics on publishing were pretty um, daunting, but I decided to write anyway and go for it and enjoy myself. Okay. Uh, so Detective Philip Cato Kwong is a, um, a Chinese-Australian detective in the WA police force. Um, he's based on a character I met um, when I was doing my documentary work. I was working on a, a TV reality, a cop show, uh, where you follow the cops around all day and night. And I, uh, at 2 o'clock in the morning, in a suburban police station in Perth, I'd come across um, a Chinese-Australian detective whose colleagues all called him Cato, uh, which got me thinking, why did they call him that, and what did he think of that? And it struck me immediately that he would be an outsider with an awful lot to prove to himself and to his colleagues. So a couple of years later, when I came to developing a character, he's who I thought of. So Getting Warmer is the, uh, the second of the um, Kato Kwong books. Um, and the section I'm going to read is not actually about Kato himself. It's about one of the people who appears to be a villain in the book, uh, a scary person. But I was interested in looking at how people find themselves um, doing bad things. And sometimes it's not always for the worst reason. Uh, and in this case, there's a, an assassin, a young uh, African guy called Diodone, uh, who's from the Congo. And he's a refugee who's arrived in WA. Uh, but he's a former child soldier. So he's grown up, and all he has known uh, since he was about 11, 12 year old is killing. Um, and so that's his only skill. Um, so he finds himself doing this thing, which we would find quite abhorrent but he has got very good reasons for finding himself there. So this is a short section uh, through the point of view of Diodone. The militias, the businessmen, the government officials, they all passed through his village and took whatever they saw. Food, women and girls, boys for fighting, lives. They took the dust. They always wanted more and they would never be satisfied. Diodone once again studied the boys around him, their eyes locked on the screens, faces twitching, transported into a cartoon world where only the quick and strong survive, a world where blood gushes and guns roar. Would they be so brave faced with the real thing? Technology. They craved it. They believed it was the answer to all of their problems. They were very, very wrong. He logged out and went to pay his higher fee. He smiled at the aggressive game boy. It could be seen as a peace sign or a provocation. He didn't care. He'd grown up knowing you can slaughter a nation in less than a week using only machetes. Hunted. With all the technology in the world, it had taken them nearly two weeks to even catch his scent. The instructions were to do it tonight. He needed to sharpen his knife. Ooh, there we go. So... That leads quite nicely into this one about, <clears throat> you know, your characters, your criminal characters, are quite unique and they have conflicting reasons for becoming um, criminals. So you've got this one, but you've got some really interesting ones even from, like, your background in Sunderland. Um, so tell us a little bit about them and, you know, whether they see themselves as the bad guys. So obviously this, this one here doesn't, and as you say, he's got good reason. But there's some other quite interesting baddies that have some um, I, I think, stories. I mean, in, in all of them, um, th there are people... I think in, in life, in, in it's generally... There's very little of the old kind of master, criminal, expert, genius person out there. Most people are kind of... They're kind of dumb or desperate. Um, they're all 
pretty much like us, um, but they've tran transgressed um, in what they do, and that's probably what makes crime fiction so interesting, um, the, the better crime fiction. Um, I've always shied away from the kind of crime fiction which is focused very much on uh, forensics and car chases and the names of guns and things. I, I, I don't do science very well. I don't know much about cars. Um, I don't really know the labels. So I'm interested in characters and society and how that works and how that, what makes us tick in that regard and how ordinary people like ourselves can transgress. Um, I've actually been binge watching lately on Happy Valley. Um, and for that, for me, that's a great series about how um, ordinary people can find themselves in horrific, terrible circumstances, but they've done things which I could easily imagine myself doing. Well, some of them anyway. <laughs> Mm. <laughs> there's, there's been something akin to um, kind of cultural cringe, you know, when it comes to New Zealand fiction in many ways, but particularly in crime fiction. And we've actually got some very good crime writers in this country who, a number of them, are very well known and received overseas, but not so well here. Um, it's all, most like people think, you know, it can't be as good as what's written over there. Um, and a talking point last year was whether Graham McRae Burnett's His Bloody Project might become the first crime fiction novel to win the Man Booker Prize. It didn't. There's no rules why a thriller would be ineligible to win that. Um, but in the 48-year um, history of the award, no crime novel ever has. So do you think, you know, is, is literary snobbery alive and well when it comes to crime writing? I was just reading an article by Adrian McKinty, who's, like myself, he's got a really good working class chip on his shoulder, and he talked about how the Booker Prize had been known for a while as uh, posh bingo, because um, it was mainly about, um, for, for many decades, it was to do with people in North London having affairs um, and, and doing the bad things like that, very posh people. Um, but that's changing, obviously, with the likes of... Um, well, Eleanor Catton's work and um, Richard Flanagan's work uh, and uh, the later ones with Graham McRae Burnett being in there. Um, I think there's a, I mean, I mean also there was a, with the Miles Franklin in Australia, uh, Peter Temple, uh, well-known Australian crime writer, won that a few years ago and that was a real, that was the first time a crime book had uh, won that award. But again, I think uh, Val McDermott, Ian Rank, and all of the better crime writers uh, will all, it's an argument that's been going around since the beginning of crime writing um, as to the value of genre fiction versus literary fiction. Uh, and I think that um, there's no kind of literary canon. There's good and bad writing, the good and bad genre writing. There's, uh, there's good and bad literature. Um, it's just out there, really. I went to a, a session at the Adelaide Festival earlier in the year, and Hannah Kent and Graham McRae Burnett were both on a, talking together uh, on a stage. Um, one was regarded as a crime writer, the other one re was regarded as a literary person. But they were just both talking about the issues of uh, writing historical fiction, um, and both of them had very similar issues. They had books set in that same era, um, looking at rural poverty, looking at a crime, all of the better stories out there seem to be to do with the crime anyway, be it from Oedipus through Macbeth through Othello, Julius Caesar, uh, you name it, they're all to do with um, blood and murder and lust and all of those things that we love. <laughs> You've got um, another extract, I think, that may relate here. Page... Uh, um, which one was this? That was in Marlborough Man. Two-one-two. Okay. Hmm. Oh, this is where I get a bit literary? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay, just here's a crime writer attempting to join the literary canon. If New Zealand is God's work, then it is unfinished. It's still finding its shape and place in the universe. 
In the night, in my sudden motel room, I feel a noticeable shudder. Something has shifted. This is the ring of fire after all. And in this sleepy little corner of a sleepy little country, the wire hour fault connects with four others, snaking from north, south, east and west into a seismic junction box known as the Marlborough Fault System, which is hardwired for imminent disaster. According to the email briefing we received before National Earthquake Drill Day, the wire hour fault is nearing the end of its interseismic period, and the current estimated hazard is considered to be relatively high. It's an E equals MC squared kind of formula, and apparently it means that sometime in the next week, or t- next week to 200 years, we're doomed. That's just the kind of catastrophizing, c- catastrophizing that really gives Vanessa the shits. She won't let me watch the news anymore because the medieval-style slaughter around the world lodges itself behind my eyeballs and my lips purse and my mood darkens. I'd like to think it's a savior complex. I'm Clarice Starling, and I have to save the lambs from their fate. (laughs) See, they like literature, don't they? They do like literature. literature. That's what these people are here for. (laughs) So... The Kato Kwong series is set in Western Australia in Marlborough, Maine, in Marlborough. Um, and they're both incredibly distinctive. Uh, landscape seems to me to be quite a major character um, in, in both of them. You know, there's absolutely no mistaking when you're reading Marlborough, Maine, that you're in New Zealand and there are Kiwis all around, and I don't mean of the feathered variety, although there's probably a few of those too. So tell us a little bit about landscape as it relates to both you know, both um, the Cato ones and Marlborough men, and how important that was to sort of um, anchor those those books? Um, well, for me, the sense of place has always been important in whatever I'm writing. Um, it's, uh, I mean, the, it's probably said by many people, place becomes a, a character in itself. But when I first uh, moved to Hopeton uh, and started writing um, Prime Cut, I've grown up as a city boy. I grew up in the northeast of England, uh, a grey, dreary, industrial place. And then I was living in um, Fremantle, which is not grey, green, and industrial, but it's very flat and it's very, very different, but very kind of safe and urban and comfortable. Suddenly in Hopeton, I had this, uh, it was a small town. There was, everybody knew who I was and where I lived. And um, the... The landscape was pretty amazing and, and epic, um, pristine beaches and hills coming down to the sea and a lot of open space with not many people in it. So that was a very inspiring place with a lot of history as well. Um, I don't know how many of you have heard of uh, Kim Scott's uh, writing, but his, uh, most of his books, Benang, Dead Man Dance and the latest one are all set down in that region. That's where he's from. So it's a very, very inspiring place with a lot of history to it. So that immediately came into play when I was writing. Um, and likewise, coming to the Waka Marina Valley, um, why wouldn't you write about a place like that? Again, it's got an amazing history. It's an amazing landscape. Um, the, the, when we got the place in the Waka Marina, um, I, I was just overawed by the, the beauty of it, the, the river rushing by. We don't have much water in WA, so rushing rivers are a, a real thing for me. Um, and all of the, the hills were covered in trees. Um, I didn't actually realize that there were, I didn't think at the time that there were actually pine trees. And by the time we got back, half of them had gone. Um, so that became a, a theme for me in the book as well. I know when I started writing Marlborough Man, um, it was, I, I wrote very poetically and literally of um, pine trees swaying in the wind like a gospel choir. And then a week later, they'd been chopped down. So good job I got the line out, line out just in time. Um, so it's a very extreme place. It's a working valley. Um, so we have to get used to the serenity and the beauty being interrupted by um, gunfire in the middle of the night or the sound of chainsaws and the trees in your line of vision crashing down and stuff like that um, but again it's it's not the city for sure and you can't help but be inspired by that kind of stuff um, so I was naturally drawn to do that and the other big nature thing up there is sand flies uh, 
nobody warned us about them, so they're a big part of the book as well. So nature is a real big thing for me in that sense of place and trying to get uh, a sense of that. Coming uh, as an outsider in both times, in Australia I was a POM, here I'm a POM and an Aussie. So uh, it's a big challenge to be um, coming in there and daring to write about the local area uh, and try, uh, hoping and trying to get it right. Um, so it means listening a lot, looking a lot and researching a lot to try and get, try and get things right. So what were some of the challenges that like some specific examples that you can say were you... There was a whole bunch of things, a whole bunch of um, terms of phrase which uh, I had taken for granted uh, that over 20 years of living in Australia, I knew the whole of the Southern Hemisphere, but of course I didn't. Um, and when I um, put the first drafts out of this book over here, a whole bunch of Kiwis said to me, we don't say that here. Um, and so I had to go through and correct all of those things um, I needed to talk to the police uh, also about uh, how the New Zealand police operated compared to the Australian police, um, the, the plant life, um, how hunting dogs work, how, how, you, how you go about pig hunting. I subscribed to Kiwi Pig Hunters Monthly for a while and got the gist. But I'm hoping to be Mr. April if I can. <laughs> What about um, culturally? You you deal with uh, well, you have a, a particular Aboriginal um, character in the Kwong, uh, the third Kwong novel, and um, Maori in Marlboro Man. So there must have been some let's say danger or um, concern about how you do that when you're not either. That's what, right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I also happen to be doing a, um, a PhD in creative writing covering that very subject at the moment. So the idea of uh, cultural appropriation and um, whose territory you can tread on, uh, I'm very, very aware of that. Uh, but I think I've also been very aware of that through the documentary making, uh, the politics of that. So I'm aware that it's a very sensitive uh, area to go into and you need to tread pretty carefully as to how far you go, what voice you use, what assumptions you make. Again, it's better to be paying respect and doing your research on that. Um, and, and I'm never trying to kind of presume or jump in and suddenly try and own something. Uh, I'm aware I'm still a newcomer, and I probably will be for the next 25 years. So I've still got a lot of learning to do, uh, and it's bit by bit with each of that. I'm, I know that Thomas Keneally is still apologising now for chant of Jimmy Black Blacksmith, so it's a long haul. Uh, you, you do need to be very careful, however good and well researched and well intentioned your writing is. Yeah, yeah, because um, the the character in Mulra Man, who's Murray, she's actually one of the the main players, really, isn't she, as the sidekick to Nick. Uh, and, and perhaps now, we're, we're talking about Marlborough Man, I'll get you to introduce the Marlborough Man and what the premise of the, of the book is. Sure. Um, so, um, Marlborough Man is uh, Sergeant Nick Chester. Um, that's his new name. He had an old name before. And he's a, he's a former cop from, of all places, Sunderland, um, which is some place I know about on the northeast of England, and he's um, in hiding from a, an undercover job gone wrong. Uh, and he thought that going up 10 kilometers up a dead end valley in New Zealand might be the best thing he could do. But of course, his past is destined to catch up with him, and it does. Um, so he's got some pretty scary Geordie gangsters after him, chasing him from the other side of the world. And um, meanwhile, there's a predator on the loose in the Marlborough Sounds and, and top of the south generally, um, who's uh, taking uh, children off the streets and he needs to deal with that as well. So he's the, the hunter and the hunted. But meanwhile, there are people doing dangerous driving things on State Highway 6 and there are pig hunters who are where, uh, where they shouldn't be and there's all of that daily grind of uh, rural policing. One thing I did notice about rural policing was in Australia, in Fremantle, if you, if you hear 
gunshots, you call the police and assume the worst. Um, calling the police for gunshots in the Waka Marina Valley is like calling them for the sound of cows mooing. It's kind of, <laughs> it's just, it's what happens. <laughs> the pig hunters, yes. Okay. So, um, coming here, I think you said you were looking at writing the fourth Cato book and that landscape spoke to you and you couldn't ignore it. So Yeah, I mean, when I first arrived, the idea was I would be writing Cato 4 uh, and that's what I said about, but I'll just, I was looking out the window at this valley and, and hearing the shots and the chainsaws and uh, all of that just took over. And so uh, Nick Chester kind of took over my life for the next six to nine months uh, and I couldn't shake it out of my head. And is, do you, did you have any concerns about doing that? Because obviously Cato's quite established now and you've got a real readership, particularly in Australia and, and in England. Was it a bit of a risk, do you think? Oh, it's a, a real risk, stepping away from uh, what you know and, and what you are known for. And there are some welded-on Cato fans. Um, not as many as I would like. I need to be able to retire soon, comfortably. But um, they are. there's some very, very loyal Cato fans out there. And to suddenly... And they're all waiting for Cato 4. Uh, and to tell them that he was not coming and somebody else was, uh, was always a dangerous... Thing, but seems to have been um, particularly well received o o over there by th those people who were waiting for Cato. That's good. And I guess that, that probably has something to do with the fact that ultimately it doesn't actually matter where it's set, it's the story that's the important thing. That's that right, yeah. I mean, yeah, if a good story is a good story, whoever's in it, and you, you, that's what you hope for. Uh, and so those people who have been following Cato are now following this new character, and you, people who've never heard of Cato. Um, have come in through Marlborough Man and we'll be hearing about these other ones as well. Um, so hopefully mm. be Would you like to introduce us to Nick? Nick Chester. Nick is, uh, page 11, I okay. think, was the one you were looking at. Isn't it? The other thing about uh, Marlborough Man was I, to set myself a challenge, Cato was written in the third per person past and I wrote Marlborough Man in first person um, present tense, because it's a, a fad that's out there, and I thought I'd become part of the fad and join the bandwagon, uh, but also kind of set new challenges and storytelling for me in, in terms of how you do get information out um, in that first person present, which when you've got multiple characters in the Cato situations, it's easier to get out the information that you need through different people's points of view. Through this, everything is through Nick's eyes. Uh, so he's spending a lot of time with Nick, and you have to like him, or even if you don't like him, kind of be interested enough to hang around with him for all of that time, uh, all of his frustrating time. Onward. It's the third night running that car has been passed, same time around 10. A low rumble, the occasional cough, missing a beat. It could be pig hunters looking for the track just up the road that takes you into the forest on the far hill. People don't come down this road for no reason or by mistake. It doesn't go anywhere. It stops about five k's up from here at Butcher's Flat. The full moon slips behind the clouds and the sil silhouettes of the hills fade into the background dark. I can hear the river down below rushing over the rocks. It could be campers heading back to their tents at Butcher's after a few beers in town, but it's too damn cold for camping. It could be scavengers after some firewood from the recently logged hills. It's meant to be spring, but it still gets down near to freezing, and there's no dry wood left in town. Besides, who's got 200 bucks for a trailer load when every other bastard is on the dole, and surely it's got to get warmer soon. In winter, the wind roars up from the South Pole across the Antarctic and Southern Oceans, dusting the Alps with snow and ice, snaking through the green fjords and lonely valleys under the door and into your bones. It'll freeze your core and consume your heart if you let it. If it wasn't for the fact that New Zealand is so bloody beautiful, there are days when you could happily shoot yourself. I live in a two-story timber house perched on the side of a steep hill that plunges down to the river. In summer it's a trickle, but in winter it boils. If the Waka Marina isn't flooded and the land hasn't slipped, my house can be reached by a narrow road winding up the valley, but the bitumen stops well before that. We're not just off the grid, we're off the tarmac. 
The valley is a good place to hide, whether from the toils and tribulations of the modern world or from real people and real threats. We're adjacent to a tectonic fault line which is statistically due for a catastrophic seismic event any day now, according to the doomsayers and geologists. That's okay. I've been expecting a catastrophe ever since I got here. It could be those weekend miners down from their day jobs in the city, here to work they claim on the 150-year-old scratchings in the riverbank that never turned a profit back then either. It's not about the gold, they say, it's about history, tradition and mateship, and an escape from whatever ails them in the big smoke. But it's not them. I know who it is. It's Sammy Pritchard. He's finally found me, and this is his way of letting me know. His reach is long, even from maximum security. Come back to bed. Yes, pet. I look at Vanessa lying there, sleep-gummed and irritable. I think of Paulie asleep downstairs. I wonder if Sammy will just come for me and let them live. No, of course he won't. So the talk about write what you know, basically Nick lives in my house. Um, he's got all of my views and everything. So um, if you read that, you'll have a pretty good idea of my daily life, apart from being hunted by Geordie gangsters. <laughs> <laughs> so there's a number of themes that run through all the books, um, uh, including family and conflicting values. And I know you're really interested in exploring various topics and social consequences and that sort of thing. So can you maybe pick a couple and, and let us know how you sort of weave those into the books? Um, I think in particular there was, um, in Prime Cut, I've been interesting all interest all along the way in uh, the issue of parenting. Um, Kato's got a son who seemed to be aging about the same time as my son. So um, when he was a teenager, my son was a teenager, so I got all of my anti-teenage angst out in getting warmer and, and bad seed, all of the stuff that was giving me the jits. Um, and so there's... Uh, um, all sorts of things, but in, in, in Prime Cut, Kato is an absent father. Um, and with my documentary work traveling overseas, I was obviously in, often an absent father as well and feeling very guilty and neglectful. Um, and, but one of the bad guys in Prime Cut um, is actually a far better parent than Kato could ever hope to be. Um, and that's shown up in a, a key moment in, in the book. Um, and so I think just trying to draw attention to uh, the failings and frailties of um, the good people in the book, the heroes, um, and some of the strengths of the, the so-called villains, just to show, again, the, those complexities in uh, that human beings aren't two-dimensional characters. There's good and bad in everybody. You know, that's a bit kind of wishy-washy motherhood, but, you know, <laughs> life is like that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And there, there's also things um, uh, that were obviously going on at the time, and, and um, there's uh, race relations and um, things like the property development, and uh, in New Zealand, in Marlborough Man, there's environmental issues coming through. Do you do you sort of go out looking for that stuff, or is it just, uh, just it, coming it's at all, you? It's always there, and I'm often thinking about it anyway. Um, I wrote Bad Seed, which is the third in the Kato Kwong book. Um, I'd been on a, a two-month residency in Shanghai, um, and I was going to explore Kato's Chinese heritage and his Chinese identity. But that was also during the course of the, the 2013 federal Australian election, um, which was all about stop the boats and all of that stuff, um, a, a major racial undercurrent. Um, to that election, so racial politics comes into that uh, um, a lot. Uh, Cato's constantly having to prove himself um, in that regard in all of the books, so the, the identity stuff comes into that a lot. Um, and I'm, I'm interested in exploring that all the time, and it's part of my work in documentary is I've, most of the documentaries I've made were for SBS in Australia, um, and all of the more interesting stories are to do with um, uh, Australia's multicultural um, society and exploring how well or how badly uh, 
uh, that is going. Um, and that's where it, it's not about me trying to be kind of PC or tokenistic. That's what I find interesting um, about uh, wh where we live. Um, and here we've got the, well, I've got big issues like logging and environment, uh, the usual thing about the gap between uh, rich and poor and, and the this kind of sense of entitlement that people have um, from that higher end of town. But I do also talk about the, um, the major issue of meat thefts from pack and save. Uh, that, that's really out there. I did read one, I, I, there was I kept a story on in doing in my research, I kept on every other day, somebody somewhere would be caught with a packet of meat down their trousers, um, and it was an ongoing thing. And then I <laughs> saw a statement from Pack and Save, and that they apparently, once they've got the meat back, will put it back on the shelves, um, which, that was a real potential horror story, I think. <laughs> And the, the family story for Nick here is, I think, perhaps guilt, that he's taken his family away from what they know, but they're still not safe, and that, that's, that's right. a yeah, dilemma. I mean, he, and he's, um, <coughs> his, they, but they're, they're all being born in Sunderland, that's what they know. Um, Vanessa doesn't want to be in New Zealand, she hates the place. Um, but over the course of that, she actually becomes more connected to... Um, her new home than he uh, seems to be, uh, and she becomes the anchor that holds them there and, and gives them some kind of stability and sense of that. But also, the Paulie is, um, he's got, uh, has Down syndrome, um, and so there's a, an extra vulnerability in there in terms of never mind being chased by Geordie gangsters, what are they going to do with Paulie when they are too old to look after him? That's always in the back of their minds, having a, what they call the Pauli Fund uh, to look after him for later. Um, and so looking at a whole bunch of things as to um, family loyalties and, and what you do to, to look after uh, the people that you love. Mm, mm. I think you've got another extract, perhaps. Uh, we went about 2.20 in Cato. Hmm. <coughs> this was Lara and the Foo Fighters. Actually, no, I won't read that one because I have to. I'll read some okay, time. sure. When I first arrived in New Zealand, I did have one last TV research job to do uh, at the beginning, and it was to do with, um, I was asked to do some research for a potential natural history program to do with New Zealand, and it was a great way for me to learn about uh, the flora and fauna and the, the geological history of the place, which really helped for me to put into the book later on. Um, the, the documentary never came off, but I had lots of stuff inside my head at that point. And so I learned all about long fin eels um, and so we were about to talk, I think, about red herrings and things, and um, red herrings are something that the crime writer has to be able to to work well with, because crime readers, um, like all of you good folk, are, you don't, you can you can see a fraud a mile off. You're very discerning, and you don't want to be cheated too early, and you want to be challenged. And so we have to try and find a way of giving away little clues here and there and then send you off on different paths that you're prepared to go along. Um, and so it, it's a real fine art, how much information you let out and, and what you, how far you go with your red herrings. Anyway, here's a red herring in the form of a long fin eel. Basically, there are two Russian um, possible assassins who have been located in the Marlborough Sounds area. Uh, are they the people who are potentially have been paid to kill Nick and his family? Um, Nick has decided to take the initiative. Deep in New Zealand's lakes and along its meandering rivers lives a monster, the New Zealand longfin eel. It's the largest freshwater eel on earth. They grow to two meters in length and weigh up to 40 kilos. 
They have leathery skin embedded with hundreds of tiny scales and covered with a thick layer of slime. They're extremely efficient hunters, relying on a hypersensitive sense of smell rather than sight to locate their prey. Their olfactory ability is several times better than the great white shark. Scientists have calculated that if just one teaspoon of blood was tipped into a lake 50 times the volume of Lake Taupo, a longfin eel would be able to detect it. Eels, like their reptilian counterpart, the crocodile, are classic ambush predators, concealing themselves and lunging at victims as they pass. To dismember a large animal, a longfin will first clamp onto a carcass with rows of small, extremely sharp teeth, using the force of its jaws to achieve a vice-like grip. It then spins its body, twisting and rolling until a mouth-sized lump of flesh is torn away. Its stomach is highly extendable, and eels will feed until gorged. A real tanifa, a monster. Impressive, eh? Gary puts the book down and smacks a mosquito on his neck. Good eating, too. The beam from his head torch dances over the bowed heads of Andre and Svetlana, who are kneeling, shivering in the, Nwak in the Waka Marina River, with Steve standing guard over them. Their hands are bound behind them with cable ties. You are making a very big mistake, says Andre. He's been remarkably calm throughout all this. Before we left Picton, I took their hotel key card and grabbed their guns and passports and wallets and crammed them into a couple of cases. We dropped the guns down a ravine somewhere along Queen Charlotte Drive, and Gary is going through Andre's wallet now. It took me best part of a year to train up Sonny Boy. Best pigger on the South Island, I reckon. He pulls out a wad of notes. That's going to cost you, mate. We are tourists, here for hunting and to look at real estate. Anything take your fancy, asked Steve. Take the money and let us go. We are not your enemies. We will not inform on you. Andre lifts his head and looks at me as, by the light of my own head torch, I examine their passports. He must have guessed this is more than just your average stick-up. Who hired you, I say. Excuse me? Svetlana says something to him in Russian, low and urgent. She's seen Gary pull a net out of the river. Oh my God. An eel. I don't know if it's a long fin or a short fin, but it really is a monster. Meanwhile, Steve is walking around them, shotty in one hand and a pan of pig's blood in the other. He's pouring the blood over their heads. You're crazy, growls Andre. What do you want from us? Who hired you? Nobody hired us. We are tourists, like we said, here for hunting and to look at real estate. This thing's a bit slippy, says Gary. Can I let it go yet? I know you are hunters. You killed his dog last night, and you've been sent here to kill me. Who killed a dog, says Svetlana. Bastards. Andre looks at me with an eye, out of an eye dripping with pig blood. He seems amused. The eel is thrashing to be free. If I was here to kill you you would already be dead. I'm on holiday, my friend. You have the wrong people. Svetlana mutters to, mutters to him again in Russian. What's she saying? She's saying she wants to go home. Why are you so calm if you're not a killer? An innocent man would be tearing his hair out and pleading for mercy. He smiles. I was a prisoner in Chechnya for three months until they rescued me. Guns, cold rivers and threats are nothing new. I'm beginning to believe him. He's a killer, but he's not my killer. <clears throat> so you were talking there about the clues that you give your readers. What about the ending? Should it wrap up the story? Should we know exactly what's happened? I think if you finish off a story not knowing what's happened, you probably feel a bit cheated. Um, so actually there's a thing I need to show you. There's a Top 10 tips for mystery writers. Just download it and it'll help you no end. <laughs> and it's got the basic rules for writing a, a crime or mystery. Um, and there's a, I want to read the whole 10 to you because I'll be a bit you know, over the top. But I'll read a few of them which are really key to what you need to know uh, and what your audience is expecting from you. So you need to introduce both the detective and the culprit earlier on introduce the crime within the first couple of chapters, 
The crime needs to be sufficiently violent, preferably a murder, and the crime should be believable um, and plausible. That's something which really turns me off if I'm reading a crime book and the killer has come up with something so excruciatingly complex and intricate that I kind of think, how much time did they spend thinking about this really gruesome thing, which is really unlikely to happen? Because most murders are kind of a stab or a hit over the head or a whatever. They're pretty quick and simple, but yeah. So somebody that goes over the top with the crime uh, begins to take it away a bit. The detective should solve the case using only rational and scientific methods. Apparently there was an oath written by G.K. Chesterton for the British Detection Club in which you've got to raise your hand and say, do you promise that your detective shall well and truly detect the crimes presented to them using those wits which it may please you to bestow upon them and not placing reliance on nor making use of divine revelation, feminine intuition, mumbo jumbo, jiggery pokery, coincidence or act of God. I do. And the culprit must be capable of committing the crime. Don't try to fool your reader because your readers, um, particularly crime readers, they read so much of this stuff and they can spot you a mile off and so uh, they know when they're being uh, messed about with. And you wait as long as possible to reveal the culprit. So there you are. I've given you the top ten tips, or seven of them anyway. You know what to do now. Yeah, we'll be expecting a lot more crime novels written locally, eh? So you actually mentioned readers there, and um, I think crime writing is read a lot by women. There's quite a good representation of men out there today. What do you know about your readers? Um... <laughs> This is actually quite a 50-50 audience. Yeah, it is. Most, most of the demographic seems to be uh, women of a certain age. Um, uh, and that's, but I think uh, crime fiction is particularly uh, popular among women. Um, and there are probably a whole bunch of very good reasons for that. Um, but, but it is a, uh, and, yeah, and, and also generally among older people. Um, and so that's interesting for me in terms of who I think I'm writing for, um, in terms of what the type of stories I choose to tell, the voice I use for that, a um, whole bunch of things. I remember I gave a talk to um, Peppermint Grove Library, which is a very posh, rich part of Perth. Um, and I think the average age of that one, the, the audience must have been about 75. Um, and right at the end, um, there was an old lady totted up to me on her walking frame and bent down and whispered in my ear, I think Cato's getting a bit sexy, don't you? <laughs> um, so I know, I'm, I know who I'm writing to and I know it's going to work. <laughs> how, how does knowing that a lot of women read your work um, impact on things like your choice of victims or the perpetrators of crime? Um, I just know from personal experience that there's an awful lot of books out there where um, young women seem to be the victims uh, of some pretty gruesome acts. And it, it's, it's, I don't know what percentage it is, but it's huge. And I just personally find myself going a bit ho-hum with that, partly because of, uh, you know, not again. Some of it has obviously been done really, very, very well uh, and very gripping, um, but I do get to wondering about with, with the ease which, with which a certain part of society is chosen as the victim, because the statistics are um, that the, the usual victims of violent crime or murder are actually young men uh, or men generally. Uh, that's the highest thing, but maybe the, the young woman victim appeals to some latent fear that's in there, but I, I've, I've, I'm not sure if I've made a deliberate choice, yes, I have made a deliberate choice to, to not go down that line so far anyway, who knows what will happen in the future, but for the most part, I tend to be killing off other parts of society and not them, uh, and I think it's, for me, the, the, the victim is not just um, a cipher or a prop to show the, the hero or heroine's brilliance, 
uh, at detecting or whatever. I think there needs to be uh, that the victim is, for me, is a part of the story of the society that you're telling. Um, so if you're going to have um, young women as a victim, then maybe there should be a lot more of a attempt to talk about misogyny and male violence and our complicity in that. But my victims, are, I'm looking at things like exploitation of underclasses or a whole bunch of other different things about society which I'm exploring. Maybe one of these days I'll get round to that, but not yet. Yeah. <laughs> we might turn to the audience for some questions. Does anyone have anything they'd like to ask? Who's going to be first? Alison. I'll just repeat that if you don't mind. So that's um, about the influence on uh, all the character behind Cato was a real man. And did you um, introduce the real Cato to the fictional Cato? I did attempt to. Before the book came out, I got back in touch with police media, media and said, you know that bloke I met two years ago at two o'clock in the morning in uh, such such police station and said, is he still around? And they got back and said, no, he's left and gone off somewhere, we don't know where he is. So I did want him to, to know that he'd been an inspiration. Um, the character of uh, Tess in the first book, Taser Tess, um, she was a real sergeant at Hopeton Police Station and um, I, she did get to, to know about um, the inspiration uh, and she was really pleased. Um, she said it was just like her. <laughs> so. Anyone in the, in the Marlborough man? Any of your neighbours? Um, <laughs> the, well, there's a, a recidivist uh, meet down the trousers type who gets pushed off a cliff called Kevin Moran, but he, he's a neighbour and he's not really like that at all. Um, <laughs> but it, it makes him, I think he's quite pleased to be that, that interesting. <laughs> there was a question from the man just behind Alison. Yeah, what was your path to publication and did you consider self-publishing at all? Okay, this was about the, the path to publication and did you consider self-publication? Um, the, the path to publication was the traditional one of trying to find a publisher who would do it. I, I never considered self-publication. I think not kind of a snobbery against it, but probably I couldn't bear the risk or whatever. Uh, but I think also my background as a documentary maker, I've always had um, the, the work that I do pre-commissioned like by a broadcaster or, or whatever. Um, and so I've always looked for, it's part of a filter, I think, of a, a quality filter for me. Um, the, the market in the form of the TV station or the publisher has decided to take a risk in me and give me a budget to do that. And so they, for me, are a test that they think uh, this will reach its audience. Um, so that has been my, my own personal path to do that. Um, in terms of getting there, as I say, when I first started writing, I didn't expect uh, or believe that I would be published. Um, but I think after a f couple of months of writing Prime Cut, I happened across a... Um, I think it was a penguin crime writing competition which wanted the first 5,000 words of an unpublished manuscript. And I think I'd written 5,000 words by then. So I polished them up and sent them off. And I was lucky enough to be the, the runner-up in that. So suddenly it kind of gave me an idea that maybe I was, uh, I did have some potential. And then the Crime Writing Association debut dagger wanted the same thing, 5,000 words unpublished. Um, and again, got into the shortlist for that. So at that point, I got tickets on myself, and um, I put my hand open to Fremantle Press, the local publisher, uh, who operate a very good crime list, uh, and they decided to take a punt on me. Uh, so I got lucky. Yep. <coughs> Anybody else? Yes, down the front here. Uh, does that mean that you don't you haven't used an agent? You just go straight to the publishers? Because many publishers now say that they don't accept manuscripts from unless they come through an agent. 
So this is a question asking whether Alan uh, has or does not have an agent because it seems many times publishers won't accept writers without an agent. Um, I didn't have an agent at the time. A number of publishers now do accept um, unsolicited manuscripts and they will they will have kind of a... I think Alan and Unwin have a kind of a, a super Wednesday once a month where you can bang your thing in that Wednesday and, and then they will look at it. Um, but maybe some... Some agents won't accept um, manuscripts either, so it can be pretty tight, but I just decided to go with whatever was open to me. Um, and um, I have got an agent now, but that was two or three years after the first being published. Um, but yeah, I think that you just look out there at the publisher's website for those that do um, have openings and opportunities, and, and they are they are out there. Hmm. Over here. Yes. Do you, did you, after the first book, then get contracted to do the follow-on Capo series, like with the timetable, time frame that you worked out with the publishers? Or? Okay, this is whether Alan worked to a time frame having had Prime Cut accepted. This is for subsequent books. Um, yeah, suddenly um, from working through my first ever manuscript, uh, then getting commissioned to write um, a further two books with a timetable attached to them, and then a further two after that with another timetable. A loose timetable, albeit, uh, but there was a timetable and the pressure was on, but um, but it's a good pressure to have. Uh, but they were out there. Um, I know with the, the, the the first book, Prime Cut, suddenly having a publisher taking an interest and looking over my shoulder um, was uh, quite a revelation for me. They, they said I was really good at writing violence and comedy, but I wasn't too good at sex. Um, <laughs> that I need to kind of really up my game there. <laughs> Cat's heard this one before. Uh, but, um, and so I remember one day I, I was sitting at home and Kat came back from her day in, at school and said, why the long face? And I said, oh, I've just had an afternoon of free metal press criticizing my sex scenes. And she said, join the club. <laughs> <laughs> and we've got a final question. Am I allowed the second one? You may. Um, have you a very effective way of editing that you could share with us? Oh, this is sharing Alan's secrets about editing. Editing. Mm. Um, I'm very used, again, as a documentary filmmaker, I'm used to going back over something many, many, many times uh, and 10, 12, 15, 20 times, whatever it takes. Um, so I'm aware that, for me, you, you have that big lump of rock and, and somewhere inside that is the statue of David and you keep on chipping away at it. But, but I don't, some people will agonize over every single word for that day. Um, I don't, I just plow on. I have a, a target of, of, let's say, 2,000 words a day, and I will bang on knowing that some of it is gold and some of it is not, um, and that I will have to go over it again and again and again. And I've got a very good editor at Fremantle Press who... Um, picks me up on everything from punctuation through to sex scenes through to everything I need to look at story-wise. Um, and so to have that uh, a good person to work with and, and to trust and to help you along. Um, but no, I ju ju I'm prepared to go back and uh, revisit every single thing. Uh, I can't say a specific tip, but, uh, but editing is a very, very good and important thing to do. Well, I've only got to eight types at the moment, so I've got another um, 12 to go. You said 10 to 20. All right. You're, you're on the way. <laughs> Excellent. Okay, we'll close it off there. But just to have you round it, uh, it off, Alan, I think you have started the fourth Kato Kwong book. I have, yes. So anybody who's eagerly awaiting Kato 4, he is on the way. Uh, I've done a, a first draft of that. Um, and it's all about... In general terms, uh, once again, the 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 uh, 
gap between rich and poor, and particularly in a boom state like Perth, and looking at the issue of homelessness. Um, so that's what uh, interests me in Cato 4. And do you think Nick Chester will come out of retirement? Uh, I, yeah, there's still a twinkle in my eye for Nick Chester. I think it'll be more of Nick to come as well. Great. Excellent. Thank you. So thanks, Alan, for talking with us this afternoon. Um, I think we'd like to all probably join in with that one. And thanks also to Paige and Blackmore over here. Um, Alan will sign uh, copies of Marlborough Man over there, so please head over that way. He will he will move down there um, to sign those for you. So thank you all for coming this afternoon. Um, enjoy the remainder of what's been a pretty fabulous um, Labour weekend, weather-wise and in terms of the arts festival and the readers and writers. And um, we hope to see you back next. Yeah.